We talked about humanitarian STEM education um, programs. You know, we, we saw uh, three videos, um, ICTs, etc. Um, you remember in the third video, he, he, the guy was calling for practicals, he called them, well, labs, hands-on stuff. Um, and uh, you, if you remember in the, um, chapter three uh, in the development strategies under international education, um, Harbor says one of the problems around the world is having just basic equipment in a classroom, not just textbooks, but any other kind of science equipment and so forth. So today we're going to be talking about trying um, to um, meet that um, need. As I said, there's two projects in class that are doing just this sort of stuff. Um, so you can think of this as appropriate technology, but for classroom, the classroom, and in particular, hands-on STEM education. Normally, this is thought of as being done in a formal classroom setting. However, um, it wouldn't have to be. It could be done in a, in a community also, a living community. Um, I view a, a, there's many types of communities. Um, we've been talking about a lot of times living communities. Um, when we start on education, we're often talking about an educational community, which includes, you know, administrators, teachers, staff, students, the whole thing, okay? Um, remember the connections to development with uh, the Human Development Index, for instance, having one component of being education. So it's certainly um, relevant to humanitarian work. Um, it's also connected to industry and community. The, the third talk on, on Monday talked about the connections between technical education and getting people jobs. Um, but it's also connected to community, right? Because we talked earlier on about this sort of idea when you go to community and participatory um, development, it, it, you know, they educate you about the situation in the community. You educate them about maintenance and engineering and things like that. Okay, so there's a sort of a trading sort of thing going on. We're going to talk about the connections between those last two and the ideas in this uh, lecture on the next slide. So what I want you to think about this STEM education projects um, as being along the lines of this diagram. So at the bottom, you can create STEM projects that are simply for fundamentals, fundamental STEM ideas. So what would be an example? My son this past year, um, in sixth grade did something called a Newton car, okay? So basically he's teaching some of Newton's basic laws of motion, for instance, the second law of motion, you know, which is F equal MA, okay? And uh, it's, it's a rubber band that propels a piece of wood, is all it is, okay? But it's cool because if they do it right, they wrap more and more rubber bands, they can push the car, or little car, whatever, this piece of wood farther across our kitchen floor. Okay, they have to, they're given requirements, etc., And they learn Newton's laws this way. They have to do the experiments, and then they have to relate it to Newton's laws. So this is sort of a, a fundamental idea in STEM. There's lots of ways to look at the fundamental ideas in STEM. You people know what I'm talking about. You've done it in your laboratories many, many times. You're just doing an experiment, for instance, in chemistry or whatever, just to understand the science, okay? It's sort of to validate what you learn in class. But there's other ways to view this because you can take a STEM experiment that will teach STEM fundamentals and it can, it can be directed in two, three different ways. Um, number one, it could be instructed local industry. So we have a project with uh, Professor Anderson going on right now. Uh, we had a suggestion from um, Colombia that we try to develop uh, a greenhouse experiment. So you do humidity and temperature control in a little house. Okay, so there's a group doing this now. And uh, why? Because in Colombia, um, well, help me out here, this world's largest exporter of orchids, 70% of the world's orchids, right, Isa? Okay, so you land in Bogota, and I'm telling you, you look around, it's like, wow, it's just a sea of, of greenhouses in some areas, okay? So this is a very important industry, teaching high school students, for instance, about what has to happen technologically to make those greenhouses work is a good idea. It, it's an, it, it, it can help them feel like they could get a job there and motivate them, just like if you were to do it here, okay? Uh, so that's one example. Um, 
I've never been able to come up with a good one for coffee in Colombia. Um, you know, because that would be really a great, great example. Um, there seems to be some temperature control things, but I've never toured some of the coffee facilities or the research facilities in Colombia. Um, next, towards community development, we'll see a couple examples of that. So this, if you're in, in a country and they have various problems with uh, clean water, why not teach the kids about how to get clean water? And I say kids, it could, be, it could be actually not just kids as in K through 12, but it could be university students too, even graduate students, depending on the level of the experiment, okay? Uh, an example of that would be in uh, the Guatemala trip this summer, um, Mary Shares will be doing um, water filtration, and there's some serious water, clean water issues in that area. Um, next one is, is, is perhaps the most unusual one in this STEM for social justice. Uh, so you know what that means um, in terms of social justice. And the normal way to learn social justice if you're in a religion is to, you know, you read the Koran or the Bible or whatever, okay? So, so you expect an engineer like me to say, yeah, okay, you can you know, do that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach people social justice with technology and math. Now, that's weird, isn't it? Not really. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, there's nothing wrong with thinking different. Okay, um, so uh, in terms of objectives, we, we, we've mentioned the transformational and utilitarian perspectives um, several times. Utilitarian being practical, let's get a job. Transformational being let's teach people their rights. Let's uh, be inclusive um, of uh, girls in STEM education, for instance, and so on and so forth. Um, so. The social justice one is clearly transformational. Community development could be transformational or utilitarian. The local industry is clearly utilitarian. And of course, the basic STEM principles apply to it all. Now you might say, well then why not just always teach the basics? Well, because if you're going to make your projects intriguing for people, you have to show relevance. It's like in the earlier writing and so forth that you can't be too abstract theoretical. Okay, so you need to show relevance in every case to the context, and that's what we'll be talking about today. Okay, um, so but this is Professor Anderson on the upper right. So she had an idea some time ago um, to, on how to do instruction in context. So what she noticed is she's going in the schools in the Columbus area is that, that a lot of the kids don't read instructions anyway. And then she'd go to some where there's language difficulties with English as a second language. And then, um, so she said, well, let's just create pictures. Okay, now you can do this in different ways. You can do the traditional approach um, it for constructing, for instance, shelves. <coughs> when you buy shelves from some, one of the comp standard companies is you have pictures like this and it kind of shows things spatially on how you pull things together, okay? This, the, the, you might be able to do something like this where you take pictures and show. So can you take a sequence of pictures or do a, do, do a sequence of drawings such that you can do two things. You want to do instruction on a scientific principle. It's not always easy, okay, because you don't have motion. I mean, you don't have a video. I'm not saying a video. I'm saying there's a lot of context. You're not going to be able to do that. Can you create a sequence of pictures or photos that would teach um, and in an appropriate way for your audience and uh, using no words, period? Second, can you show via a sequence of pictures how to construct a hands-on STEM experiment? Okay. Now, Professor Anderson has several examples of this at our website if you're interested in taking a look. Okay, next. So here's a key, you, you, you might think that it's difficult to do instruction in context. Um, back in the 90s, uh, I gave a, a talk at a university, in, a short course actually in Colombia, and I, I was teaching optimization theory. Optimization theory is just basically, think of it as hill climbing, okay? You're, you've got this hill, and you don't know the whole hill thing, <coughs> and you try to move a point around the hill to get to the top of the mountain. So I was trying to put this in context. So I went to the US Geological Survey and downloaded the world data on uh, elevation, lat and lawn and elevation. And you can mess with a little bit in MATLAB 
And you can produce, uh, if you use the standard color schemes, it's fascinating because what blue ends up being in the ocean, red, end, red ends up being in the Andean mountains here, okay? And uh, you can, I, I make force black to be zero. Of course, it comes out as the coastline. And before you know it, you look at this and you say, well, I, when I see this, I see things coming out of the board. The mountains are coming out of the board. So just to make that a little clearer, you can just replot it MATLAB using surf. And there, there's the Indian mountain ranges, okay? So I was lecturing um, right there, okay? And turn on, and I, I literally then took an algorithm at it operate over this thing, and I had it find the highest point in Colombia, which is Isa. I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> it's, it, it's actually, it, it's this guy right here, it's Santa Marta. Um, I had to learn it because I, I had to know that when I'm standing in front of the crowd, right? I don't want to be embarrassed. Okay, so, but what's fascinating about these pictures, you don't realize, look at the mountains under the sea. Look at, look at the depth. Well, there's Panama. Okay. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating. But when you do this, I can tell you this. You can just watch people's faces when you're in. Watch the questions after this. When you teach in context, right? I mean, it, it matters because people, people are thinking about this. I mean, they, they're driving in and out of these mountains all the time. They're walking. Some people are walking up and down the side of them. I mean, it means something to them. So this is an example of how you can in, do instruction in context. This was at, at more a uh, senior undergraduate slash graduate student level. Okay. So we're going to talk about examples of how to do it with children too. But I want to point out that you can do, many times do this sort of thing and teach in context. Okay. So STEM experiments. Let's talk, talk about... Um, K through 12 and university a bit. So you, when you think about STEM experiments, you think about them either being in a classroom or a laboratory. Um, and the specifications, uh, Professor Anderson's uh, given me these. Uh, so you want a pre-project instruction, perhaps by a teacher, like a lesson plan. You want to keep it simple, hands-on, so they're really doing something, not just sitting back, falling asleep, watching the teacher teach boring science, right? Uh, make it easy to construct and operate, and create excitement. I mean, it's got to be fun to do. You want something that explodes or something. I mean, you right? Not really, but you know, I, it, it, we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Um, have visuals and tactiles. Um, have a clear educational value in terms of STEM. Um, in the instruction, you would often make connections between the STEM idea in the experiment and then what's around you. So what I would do if I'm standing up, if I were to teach my son the Newton car, I know exactly what I. I'd stand up there with my son in front of class and embarrass him by pushing. Why? Action, reaction, right? It's the same idea as the Newton car being pushed, right? I mean, the, the science is you know, about principles, as you well know. But you want to make, it, make these connections, make these broad connections so they can see it in other places in their life. Um, Professor Anderson says 30, 40 minutes instructional, hands-on, and then a post-project assessment discussion about what you might have learned and so forth. At the university level, you know what to do, so I'll just mention, you know, the typical laboratory setting at the university is you pick the right level, you connect to class theory, you do a pre-lab, you have lab procedures in the lab, and you do a post-lab, you turn it all in, you're graded. That's the typical standard format for a university um, laboratory. Okay, let's do some examples. Professor Anderson's most popular example is in the upper left-hand hand corner. That's a speaker, okay? Now, she's done children um, down to second grade that have some difficulty because they're, as you know, on a speaker, there's, there's a coil here, okay? There's a magnet inside there, and uh, you have to wrap that coil, and little, little second graders have a hard time wrapping the coil, so you have to wrap the coil for them. But older kids can all do this. She, she says that, Everybody gets it working, okay? She is, with children in the Columbus area, built 9,000 of these, okay? This works. This is a great experiment. At the end, you take these two leads, you hook it on to enough, uh, an old thing, and you pop out your phone, and you play music on the speaker, and it works. You can, you can hear it, okay? Kids love, love this thing. You watch kids do this. They 
are excited. Okay? Now, um, question. If you're in a country, what are you going to do? Now, the problem is not every kid is going to necessarily have this in their pocket. But um, when we've done this in Colombia, they've had radios they brought in and plugged in the, uh, um, the speaker, and all the kids get a listen, so it works out fine. And of course, what they're listening to then is, is radio music in Colombia, which is people like this, right? I mean, which is really great. They're not listening to what's on my iPhone, okay? Well, I happen to have both those people on my iPhone, but. Um, my point is, is that it's in context. They might pop on the radio station, a soccer game might be on. I mean, it's, it's really intriguing to have it in local context. Now, this can be taken further. Um, what I put up here is a simple circuit um, for the other direction. You, in, in terms of turning the speaker into, um, uh, you can hear, so this is, well, you understand that a speaker creates sound, but you can turn it around if you talk to a speaker create current in the coil. Okay, simple electrical engineering idea. So every microphone is a speaker and every speaker is a microphone in that, in that sense for this kind of a device. So you, and, and Professor Anderson's done this, she can literally take this output right here, shove it into her laptop, talk to it, and it'll record her voice. No changes whatsoever. It works, that's fascinating. So if that's the case, well then, let's take two, Let's give Tyler two. Let's give me two. And let's connect a wire between us. And suddenly we have a walkie-talkie with a wire, right? Cut the wire and put a simple RF device. We've got a walkie-talkie. This is the basic element. A, site, the, a transmitter receiver thing, you got it worked out, okay? But you can do a walkie-talkie. Okay, another one that Professor Anderson does is, is this one, which I think is really nice. The children in the Columbus area love to you know, they can light up OSU, which, you know, all kids, but like one in the Oklahoma area who likes Michigan, likes Ohio State, okay? Um, my daughter that age liked Michigan. She was just to be a pain. Um, she converted, though. But <coughs> in Colombia, you can do the same thing, but what happens in Columbus, they usually do their own initials. And most children in Columbus area have three initials. Okay, in Colombia, everybody has. Not everybody. Most people, right, Isa? Have four. We're not used to use those that much. I'm sorry, what? We don't use that as much. You don't use the four. We don't use like abbreviations that much. Ah. Oh. When I came here, like everybody also started speaking abbreviations. I was like, what is that? What is that? What is that? We are oh. not used to using those. So you wouldn't use. Yeah, I know that about the universities, but for your own name. I mean, you know, it's not a con well, once in a while somebody will say KP to me. I think that's another thing. I don't know why professors reply here with the initials. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, we use initials a lot more. I, I learned that in Colombia the first time one of the first times I was there teaching at the university, I said UPB for Bolivariana University and, and I was like, well, we're standing in the university. You would think they would know it. Like OSU. That's like, you wouldn't use OSU. So like Uni Andes for Universidad de Los Andes. It's Ariana. Yeah. I know that for my university, like P-U-J. Universidad Pontificia Javeriana. We say Javeriana. U-P-J. Oh, we say Javeriana. Yeah. And it's Udinar for impasto. So. Okay, so maybe this wouldn't fit so well. But you can add more. They can do their first name. I don't know. So these cultural things are difficult. Um, next. Here we are. This is a group in uh, Pasto at the SEO um, at the University of Day. But I know Pasto is, just to give you context, it's uh, sitting about right there. Okay, right down by Ecuador. This is we went on spring break with Professor Anderson and I and um, 11 students, OSU students. Um, this is a group that um, built, uh, they, they set up this experiment to build a solar cooker. Um, and uh, it, it, the idea is you, you take out the sun and 
you're able to heat things up um, and cook items with it. Um, so we got some uh, local help here from uh, some Colombians on how to identify and set up this project. So um, we were told that there's energy issues in the plastic area and the commu surrounding community. Um, and so that this, this could be thought of as useful. Uh, the, uh, this thing worked. It's a good experiment for like, but it has a problem, uh, and nothing against the students or anything, and that it's a standard problem I'm going to bring up in a little bit for some of our own experiments at OSU, and that is it's kind of boring. Because temperature is boring. Because you can't see it. Now, if you hook up an Arduino to this and do some data acquisition, it gets a lot more fun. The other problem is we can't be guaranteed to go out and be able to cook something like, you know, cook an empanada or a repa or something like that because we can't be guaranteed it's going to be sunny out. That would be cool if you took it outside and you cooked your lunch, right? But it's a little problematic because you're not sure about the sun. Okay. Um, here's a filtration experiment set up by uh, uh, Taylor Arada, uh, Mary Sher, and uh, Ramon Weldon Michael. Um, and uh, basically, the, the layout you see here with the, the children is uh, there's, if you look at this carefully, there's like big rocks, smaller, smaller, and it's <coughs> cotton. And so when you run various you know, water that's contaminated through this, there's a very simple principle is, is that the big rocks take out the big things all the way down to the littler things being taken out. Little, that's what they teach in this experiment. That's really... Um, the kids all had a great time, worked great. Um, they, they like to play with gunk. Kids typically do, right? I mean, gunk is fun. I mean, you put it in, and this is all clean stuff, and you pour gunky water through it. The water comes out pretty clean, and all the gunk's in there. I mean, this, is, this, is, this really went over well with the children, I think. Um, next, this is a group I was doing. Um, uh, there were three students who did this. Stefania, um, Nick, Nico, and uh, I can't remember, I remember the other one off the top of my head. Uh, an LED flashlight, and uh, you learn about series of parallel circuits and LEDs, batteries, and so forth. And uh, this worked good too because they walked away with something that they could literally work. I mean, it's a bright LED. It actually is a little flashlight when they're done that they get to take with them. It's very, very inexpensive. Um, so uh, then uh, an electric train. This one doesn't have a clear connection um, to local industry or anything. Basically what it is, it's hard to see. I couldn't get a good photo. You take a, the children take a coil and wrap it around a doll rod, doll rod, and, and then they um, take a battery put bat uh, and put um, magnets on either end of the battery that stick to the end of the battery. And if you take that and stick it in the coil, it actually races through the coil. Okay? Um, and if you close the two ends, it'll go and run, the, it'll just run around the thing. It's, it's fascinating. And there's some basic electromagnetics that are going on there that can be explained real easy. I mean, they were having a blast. The, the kids playing with this, that they, each team would get it going and then they would join up and make a big track. And it would go around. Um, so this one also, all, all the experiments actually worked out good, I think. Um, now, back to some of Professor Anderson's, I, I don't have all of her things, I just stole these off her website. Um, and. Uh, you know, she's got an audio equalizer up in this corner, another light experiment. This is a uh, flashlight, um, Faraday flashlight, and uh, this is a little motor. This thing's really cool. So you got a magnet, this little coil, and it's sitting there with battery, and that baby spins. It's a DC motor. It's a very easy um, experiment to gather. This is a heart rate monitor. So what you can do is you, you take this thing, um, uh, um, Put the clip, the potato clip, over your finger. It shines a, a, a uh, infrared, infrared or UV, infrared through your finger, uh, which go, we're in, we're invisible to it, so it goes right through us. But it turns out that it, it the, the metallic substances in your blood um, set it off. And so what you can do is, is that as it pumps your blood, um, this this LED will come on, okay, and you can get your heart rate right off of the clip. Um, Question is, is you know, 
Like, okay, the, these, all these have a nice uh, sort of uh, excitement factor, but the question is, how do you put in context? Do you see the challenge? And maybe you can't, okay? But if you can, you probably want to try. I mean, as far as I know, Colombian heartbeats are the same as American ones. Um, but, you know, the DC motor, what, what's different about DC motor in Colombia versus here? I have no idea. I don't think there is. I honestly don't. Or an audio equalizer or a Faraday flashlight. So some experiments are just going to be basic STEM experiments, and that's fine. Other ones will fit, okay? Um, next, let's talk about now some other experiments. I'm putting pictures of people that are my... Uh, Kevin Schultz and Ted Pavlik, who have helped build this. This is Andres Pantoja and Wilfredo um, uh, Alfonso from Colombia, who have improved on some of these experiments. Um, and uh, so we have a smart light experimental test bed that was developed in collaboration with industry in Ohio, okay, Energy Focus Incorporated. Um, and then Professor Anderson, I showed this one time, and she's like, hey, I can invent a simple version of that. She invented this little circuit, and this circuit simply, when it's bright out, it turns the LED off. When it's light out, it turns it on. And it's a simple little idea that's easy to teach a high school student. So she transformed a PhD level experiment down to uh, something that you know a sixth or grader to a high school student could do. Right? Um, I think you could do the other direction too, actually. Um, in some of these experiments. So, um, what about teaching social justice? This is the unusual case. So there's a number of things that matter, like context and culture. Now, in terms of the technologies, um, you have the possibility to have a group of humans in a one central technology, like a design team. You could have children try to work together to design something, a technology. You can do that all the time in your capstone design, okay? Uh, but there's other ideas, we'll provide one of them. Or you can have groups of humans with groups of technologies. Let me show you some examples about what I mean here. Um, first one is cooperative synchronization. Um, <clears throat> you know in the United States when everybody is in a uh, theater and you clap at the end like this, and you know what it sounds like. In Europe that's not how it goes. In Europe the way it goes is it starts like that and then everybody sings. Whole audience sings. For some cultural reason, that's the tradition, they can all sing. Okay? That synchronization is, is absolutely fascinating that it even can occur. It happens in nature. If you want to ask, look, it's, I, put these, I dumped up these, these links because they're really cool. Um, fire, synchronized fireflies um, in Southeast Asia along rivers, uh, millions of fireflies come out at night and they're blinking at the beginning of the night, they're all unsynced and then over the night they just all sink and all the whole thing just goes like this okay so synchronization is done all the time synchronization is the focus of uh, one of our teams so we're going to have um, a demo of synchronized um, lights with circuit from this class on uh, during the final exam period okay now other things in electromechanical um, cooperation this is a, a group juggling. This was put together by a number of my past uh, PhD students um, early on in our programs. This thing, um, we call it a juggler. You'll see why in a second. So ignore three of the tubes. You got one tube, you got a, a ping pong ball, and a, just a standard tube that um, covers a, a fluorescent bulb. You know, you just go to Lowe's, you can buy one of these for next to nothing, all okay? right? Conveniently, a, a ping pong ball, ball sits right inside it, but with a little extra room around the edges, okay? We make a box here, construct it, take a standard computer fan as of, you know, um, 10 years ago, standard computer fan for a you know, box type computer, not a laptop. And uh, so you got a voltage input here, got an ultrasonic sensor up here, okay? That can bounce sound down the tube, gets a return, and there, calculates the difference in time between the send and receive of the sound, and it can then know the distance between the top and where the ball's at. So you can sense the height of the ball. You can set up a little control system to balance the ball by actuating the voltage on the fan and reading what the sense position is. 
Okay. Now, that's not actually that interesting. That's actually pretty easy to do. What makes it interesting is we take four of these at the same time in parallel, but we do one more thing then. We take the bottom box and we connect it with another box. And that box has a hole in the bottom. So now what happens if this guy pushes his ball up, guess what, that one comes down. Now try to balance the balls. It's a lot, lot harder because you start focusing too much on one, everybody else goes down, so you gotta always, so one strategy might be to focus on pushing up the ball that's at the minimum height. And so we try to lift the balls up together is what the objective of the experiment is. And it's actually rather challenging for a computer to do it. So right now, um, uh, I gave this idea to a group in Professor Anderson's design class. They're going to do a non-automated version. They're just going to take, forget about the ultrasonic sensors, just take the balls and operate fans and give them to kids and say, okay, you, you know, you lift your ball. Well, they hit the fan, ball goes up. This guy does his. I said, okay, now work together and lift all the balls up, keep them at the same level and as high as you can get them. Okay. So what are you teaching the children then? You're teaching them to cooperate, right? Because if one is too selfish and raises their ball too much, everybody else's goes down. So it's got to be a give and take. And I think if you think about um, social justice, a lot of it is about cooperation. Okay, so this is a way to study cooperation. Now, uh, this is Nico Arquiano. He's at um, Universidad de los Andes. He, uh, when he, he's a professor there, and so he had his students build a version of this, um, and it's right here. It's down in their lab now, and they use it. Okay. Um, now, I think this is an extremely cool project. I'll tell you why. When I talked to the undergraduates at the beginning of the semester about it, I pointed out to them that this is cooperative gaming. I don't know if we have any gamers in class, but or if you're familiar with cooperative gaming, um, but this is a a niche industry or area in gaming today. And, uh, but this is electromechanical game, okay? So the students, you know, they had, when I talked to the undergraduates, had tons of ideas of how to extend this experiment and take it somewhere, you know, uh, further and think the kids will really get a kick out of it because they like to do game. Of course, what do you teach in terms of STEM? The basic STEM is voltage, motor, you can do mechanical parts of this, right? I mean, you can think about, you know, writing down equations of motion for balls, etc. I mean, there are tons of science underlying this thing that's easily taught, okay? So this is one where you, do ba you can do basic STEM, you can uh, teach cooperation, it's intriguing for people. We'll see how the design team, of course, this is a presentation coming up pretty soon, we'll see how good they do. Um, but uh, this one's got a lot of uh, expandability, really. Next one, electromechanical arcade. So in, at least in this country, um, kids that do games like to kill things. Um, like my sons uh, are continually, continually killing on COD and killing zombies. And geez. So uh, here's one that's like that. So this is a uh, cooperative shooting game, an arcade. Um, the idea is simple, I'll explain it as an old timer. Um, you go to the fair, and you got that little guy that pops up his head and you shoot him, right? And they, they, they pop up, pop up, and you go shoot, 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 like that. And it's a standard game fair, you win the big bear if you shoot down 10 of them or whatever, okay? What this is is cooperative gaming. So it's as if you go there with your friend, you stand there and it comes up and you get two people shooting. And how do you cooperate in order to get the highest point spread? That's a hard problem, actually because you don't know where things are popping up. This simulates that because these are guns here on motors that point. These are the targets that come up randomly. And then if when a light is on, comes on randomly a target, if, you're, if you shoot at it while it's on, you get a point. Otherwise, you don't get a point. So you don't know what's going to pop open next. And you've got to go look around, OK? Um, this is. Uh, this is still up in our lab and working. It's, it, I try to get the students to make it low cost. It's not, this is not very well done in terms of low cost. They spent way too much money on these motors and uh, the drivers for them. Uh, but the rest of it's cheap. These are just laser pointers here that they're operating. Okay, So this could be a very low cost um, um, experiment. Next. 
planar temperature control. Um, this was uh, Nikodor Kihano, the bottom right, who started this. He is the one that had the idea of the whole low-cost labs project, in fact. So he, this was his master's thesis um, project. You can get it at the web if you want. Um, a few other Colombians on the left that redid the experiment, make it look a lot nicer, Don and Kali. Um, and uh, this is fantastically great to study analytically. It's, it is really a cool problem to study. The problem is, it is really boring. The most interesting thing is these lights blink. It's like, you don't know why they're blinking. Because you can't see temperature. So what you would typically do here is you try to make, the, the, what you have is the lights are flashlight bulbs. The black guys here are sensors, temperature sensors. And so what you try to do is you try to make the temperature the same all over the grid. And so what happens is, is, is the point on the grid that, that, that for instance, is lowest, temp and then you only let them turn on, like, um, if there's, there's 16 zones here, I think in this case it's one, two, three, four. You let it turn on only four lights at once. So what it does is it takes the, minimum, the four minimum temperatures and hits them with a light for a little bit and turns them off and then reapplies. And uh, it's fantastic. It comes up with equal temperature across this zone. This is actually an important industrial problem in semiconductor manufacturing, in uh, glass manufacturing. Now, this is a real problem, okay? Um, the problem is, is can you, uh, how interesting is it to watch operate? So we, we purchased back then, um, this is a, uh, the color of the sheet changes based on temperature. So we had the idea we were gonna lay this across this guy. And it works kinda, but not, it, do, it doesn't make it cool, you know what I mean? Um, but it's, it's a great, um, it's a great uh, research challenge problem too. It seems it's only grad students. Although, you can do temperature control with one zone. That's simple. You know how cheap it is? I mean, <laughs> oh, it's really cheap. I mean, Nikita was fantastic. He would just call up the companies and they'd give him equipment all the time. I'd give him part of his parts. He's like, what cost? There's no cost. But, um, you know, we're talking about pennies for a flashlight bulb and a se the sensor. It's really, really cheap. And then to interface to those two, you need a transistor to drive the to drive the light, and you need uh, just a simple uh, voltage divider to handle this uh, output of this guy. So it's it's an extremely cheap experiment set up. It's just the question is how exciting it is. Okay. Um, next, multi-zone temperature control. Uh, that's Jorge down on the right. He's the guy that's doing the corruption stuff down in uh, Cali these days. Um, and uh, that's a younger picture of him. Um, so. He built this house. This thing has a lot of sophistication to it. You can just think of it as a dollhouse if you want, but you know, it has rooms, and each room in the heater can be turned on and off. The doors can all open and close. The windows can all open and close. But it's more than that. You can actually, it doesn't, sh this isn't a great picture, because on these um, windows, he made little fans. That he bought these really dinky little fans that hooked on the window, and you could slide it in and out. So you could simulate having a window open with wind coming in, okay? And then what you're trying to do, of course, is do temperature control for the whole building at the same time when you've got wind, various wind conditions, opening and closing doors. When you look at the data on a computer coming in, it's great. I mean, it is really cool. Again, the problem of temperature control. It's, it, temperature is just boring. Unless you're burning someone, and you're not gonna do that. Right? It's just boring. So uh, it's nice for I think undergraduates and grad students. I, I don't think you, you know, for kids, it's probably not so fun. Okay? Any comments? And this is cheap. Again, th there's, that's uh, really quite inexpensive. And of course, it's very important um, industrial control problem. I mean, can you imagine what OSU could do if it could regulate its temperature in its building? So was it freezing yesterday or what? Okay, we, we can't do it at OSU, it's impossible. I mean, it's technologically impossible. Um, if we could do it, we could give out a lot of scholarships to undergraduates. Okay, here's an idea that's not been done, but I think would really be cool. So let's say we could all take out our phones, have an app, and we could control the juggler with our phone. It, it, it's not that hard. It's got to be cool, right? It's 
it's got to be doable. Um, I mean, for high school students too, they can all pop open their phones and do something like this. But there's a lot more they could do too, right, than just control that juggle with their phones. You could do a lot of stuff with phones in the U.S. for cooperation. I mean, and you know how excited students are. Everybody, everybody's excited about the phone, right? How many people? How many teenagers you know don't have a phone anymore? You know, that's very rare. Okay, so I think there's a lot here that can be done um, with communications technology. I, I think if you were to ask me what one experiment should be done first right now, it's the walkie-talkie. And the reason is, is because just think what technology you think people value the most in the world. I don't think it's water filtration. I think it's a cell phone. I mean, over six billion subscriptions, that says it all, right? So we should teach children about communication. And the cheapest way to do that is clearly a walkie-talkie. I mean, it's got to be. I mean, you, you just imagine walking in a classroom to teach about um, communications. You, you, you could start with a cell phone, and you say, well, let's go to the simple way. And then you, you could talk, and then you could say, what about the cup and string, right? Um, kids love the cup and string. Um, and then you could build the speaker, Professor Anderson's speaker, and then you could build a microphone, then you can link them up. I mean, you're building a cell phone, if, especially if it's an RF link, right? I mean, a radio frequency link. I mean, it, I, think, I think the walkie-talkie is um, something we really need to do at Ohio State. Um, we haven't come across it anywhere else yet. So, okay. Um, next, call for involvement. That means you. So. Uh, and some of these projects, like um, the Walkie Talkie or this group uh, app thing, um, course credit may be possible via an independent study, for instance. Uh, it can satisfy the six credit hour project version of the humanitarian engineering minor. I want to show you um, some of our uh, current um, progress. Um, we have this uh, iSTEM project. Uh, we call it International Inclusive STEM Education Program. Um, we have so many eyes to use, we decided to use two and just use iSTEM because we thought it sounded like iPhone. So here's, here's the program um, website um, if you'd like to look at it. Uh, so um, there's um, school age experiments, okay, and um, there's Professor Anderson working with a student, um, and some ideas about how to develop such experiments. Uh, and some pictures of, of some of her experiments and a link to her website. This website's out of date. We, we, the five, we had uh, was it five, four, four uh, projects for the trip to Columbia over spring break and those are all not posted yet because the students are working on documentation for them. All right, they'll get posted soon. And a number of other projects are not posted yet. So there's the kids thing at the university level. Um, well, there's a lot here. Uh, let me just say, let me just show you the one that's the most populated website that has all this stuff I just described, the planar temperature control, all the details. What we generally do is ask anybody that's gonna contribute to this to give everything, okay? In other words, you, you give us the part numbers, the cost, how to construct it, the whole thing, so that we give it away, okay? And anybody, anybody um, can use it. So. We've got a number of projects for university level, a number for uh, school-aged children, and we have um, a pretty sizable team uh, a team involved here. Um, the team's kind of, it's people from all, well, a number of locations around the world. Um, and uh, so anyway, the, if anybody would like to get involved, um, just let me, uh, or Professor Anderson, um, know about that, um, we'd welcome you on board. I think that if you ask me what, what the, pro the problems with the program, there's been more electrical engineers involved than any other engineering, and therefore you saw the character of the, the experiments. I, I, I don't like that. I don't think it should be that way. It should be that we have non-electrical things. So one of the projects in this class, the Sterling Engine, is clearly not an electrical engineering thing. It's more of a mechanical engineering thing, so I think that's really great. Um, 
So, so, but I'd like to see more. Uh, the water filtration thing you could argue is chemical or um, civil engineering projects. So we have some that are non-electrical. Okay, the, cooks, the solar cooker you could argue is is mechanical too. So we have a number of them, but we we could use a better balance um, of experiments um, uh, for the kids because there's there's just so much you can do in this area. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, of need um, and uh, again this is about don't forget this is about technological capacity building right well, that, that's a very important thing in humanitarian engineering it is to focus on that especially if you can connect to the community local industry if you want to do social justice type things um, I tend to do in my own research what everybody else is not doing okay so I'm intrigued with the social justice question. Can you teach principles of social justice with tech STEM? I mean, that is different. I think it's challenging, okay? And clearly cooperation is one where we can do it. But there's, there's other ideas along that lines that are possible. Okay, uh, so any questions, comments?